that it's a meeting of Hardwick Electric Department. All commissioners are present, as is Mike Sullivan, uh, Paul Fix, Qu Christine Halquist, and Jessica Patterson. Uh, are there any modifications to the agenda? No, uh, no, no. To agenda. Under new business, we ought to discuss uh if we're gonna or what the plan is going forward for continuing zoom or meeting yes. together or whatever yeah no i think that's that's right but that stays where it is yep. business um is there a motion to approve the minutes so move I should Second. Say, okay uh all in favor aye uh, the minutes are approved. Um, is there a motion to approve the agenda? I move to yep. approve the agenda. Uh, second. Is there a second? I didn't hear a second. Second. Okay. Uh, any objection? Hearing none, the agenda is approved. Um, since there is no one from the public, uh, unless, Paul, you want to, you have some public comments independent of what you're here for? You're, you're, you're muted. Um, no, I do not. Uh, so I think we move to the next item, which is uh, NEKB's uh, proposal about a poll <clears throat> survey. So I, I, I'll turn it over to Paul and Christine. Um, so <laughs> just by way of introduction, I'm Paul Fix. I'm Hardwick's representative to the Northeast Kingdom Broadband Communication Union District, called by Phil Scott a CUD, but I like to call it a CUD because I'm not in the business of cows. Um, at, any, at any rate, as part of uh, the work we're doing, each town who, of, I think it's 30 something towns at this point, Christine would have the actual number i suspect at any rate um you know we're all in different places when it comes to where we are uh preparing to have fiber broadband high speed brought to the community and as part of this uh one of our our vice chair reached out to me about um a project to identify and geolocate the Hardwick electric poles. And so that's really what prompted this conversation. And in broad outline, my first outreach was to the town because we're hoping that the town will fund a portion of this with ARPA funds and we would fund another portion with ARPA funds. Now, and of course, being in Hardwick Electric's territory, you play a key role in any project involving poles, though I suspect you don't own them all. I think some are probably owned by Consolidated and, and others. So it's a, it's a complicated thing. And with that, um, Christine Hallquist was hired, uh, I don't know, more than half a year ago during the pandemic to be our administrator for the communication union district. So with that, I'll turn it over to her. Yeah, so uh, the, what, for, for us, for our purposes, uh, we use the poll data for high level design. You know, we basically to come out with, come up with the routes, get a rough idea where the hubs are gonna be and come up with an overall cost. When we go into detailed design, that involves actually going into the make ready process. Um, and that's, you know, how much, how many actual feet of fiber you use. But there, you know, most of the towns and uh, most of the area has uh, poll data that's adequate for high level design. There are two towns in our district that Barton and Hardwick that don't have that poll data. So, you know, if we're gonna go out and collect poll data, we might as well collect everything that's possibly needed uh, for the utility because it's, you know, the incremental cost of doing, you know, putting all, all the hardware and the other information that it is, is, is really insignificant in the terms of the overall budget. So I've been working with VEPSA. Um, VEPSA, of course, has been trying to uh, get a connectivity model of their entire network. 
um, um, I forget the gentleman's name who was hired to do their GIS stuff. But, you know, he's, I've been talking to him. He says, oh yeah, we're going to go out. You know, get, us, get us the wire size and get us all these other things. With the ARPA funding coming along, you know, what we thought we would do is approach the towns, uh, you know, with the towns within the Hardwick Electric District. Um, if we look at the total cost of the study, it's about 208,000 for the, for the uh, roughly 325 miles that you have. It might be a little more right at this point, but, um, but Hardwick share is about 37% of that, you know, and, and you, we would only request half of that from each town, we pay the other half. So, you know, you look at 37% of 208K, you know, you're down to 77K. So just to give you an idea, the hardwood can back would be half of 77K or, you know, or, or 36 and a half K. Um, we, there are two towns we probably won't approach in your service territory. And that's Elmore and Callis because they have such small, you know, small mileage in terms of the overall but, though, but you know, before we approached those towns, we wanted to get a feeling of what the Hardwick Electric Department board thinks of this and specifically, Mike, you know, what do you think, you know, how, if that's a valuable exercise. In other words, we're gonna probably do it anyway, but, but collecting all the information makes sense. Yeah, so we are, Hardwick Electric is in need of mapping our system uh, for multiple reasons. And I looked at several of the BEPSA members looked at using uh, MPower services to get that project done. And the cost that MPower gave us was exorbitant. It was like $230,000, um, which, you know, we, we couldn't swing that for mapping. So I started investigating other avenues and started working with Belco um, because Andrew Flynn has worked on our what we have for maps uh, since I've been here for whatever years I've been here. And uh, he kind of turned me on to this new uh, LIDAR technology. Okay. And the LIDAR project is kind of a front burner waiting for me to uh, pull the trigger on getting that done. They predict they can locate 80% of our poles and wires via the LIDAR, so we'd only have 20% uh, to actually locate and then build the database of what's on those poles and what size wires they are, et cetera. And we were working down that street when your name came up and your inquiry started coming up. So I put everything in park to hopefully connect with you and... Uh, work together to get a solution that's good for everybody. So that's where Hardwick is at, Hardwick Electric's at. Okay, sounds, that sounds great. That's kind of what kind of I was looking for is, you know, do this in partnership and make sure we get all the data that's needed. And, and you know, the plan was to go out for an RFP and exactly, you know, I think the cost, you know, when I talk about a total cost of 208,000, that's definitely a high estimate. We shouldn't have to pay that much. You know, you got an estimate of, I forget what you said, but it was even higher. Yeah. But, you know, I'm saying this for budgeting purposes. I always like uh, budget high and come in low. <laughs> Christine, when you said 325 miles, you were talking about not the town of Hardwick, but Hardwick Electric Service Territory. Or you're yeah, talking about the town of Hardwick. No, the town of Hardwick, and Mike, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, is, you know, it looks like it'd be about 37% of the total mileage. So I'm only going to approach the towns, or we're only going to approach the towns for the mileage that's within their town. Three twenty-five is our total mileage win. That's what I thought. That's what I yeah. thought, but that's I just wasn't sure because it, I thought I thought you then said Hardwick, so that was what. I'm yeah, I show your mileage in Hardwick of being. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. I, 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 I as I say, I thought three twenty-five was was HED's total. Yeah. Okay. Um, so. So what? what so. What are you asking HED to do? I mean, that's what are you asking from us? Well, that, I think I question. think Mike just gave me the answer that I hope your board will support. You know that we work together to and and I just want I just wanted to give you you know we want to approach the town, but of course we would want your support as we approach these towns 
for you know half of the ARPA money for these towns. And you know, I don't think it's a very big bite in terms of the ARPA funds that are coming, but I wouldn't want to proceed if you as a board uh, were not supportive. What would be we be supportive of? That's that's yeah, that's that's the a question. Study? Are we, you asking us for money or are you asking us to support you when you go to the town for money? Well, I guess I'm asking you to for your you know, your support when you go to the towns, you know, Mike has, Mike has said he needs this information. We're coming along and saying, yeah, we do too. Let's split the cost. You know, it seems like it's a win-win for, for including the towns. Um, but, but right now you're just looking for that poll information. Yes. And the project is to pay for that. That's correct. If I could jump in quickly, this is Paul. So, the communication union district, which has existed for somewhat about a year now, just completed a business plan that will have us running fiber to pretty much everywhere that can be served off an electric pole over the next five years, which means over the next, well, and the project starting in a year. So we've got a year of design work effectively going on. Five years of work or four and a half years of work that would let anybody sign up by the end of the fifth year. And along the way, obviously people, the fiber passes will be able to sign up. So as Christine said at the beginning, most of the towns in our district already have this geolocated poll data that we can use for that high level and then the detailed design. Hardwick Electric service area, many of most of the towns are, are in our communication union district and Barton don't have that data. So in order to even get to the design process that we need to move our business plan forward, this has to happen in Hardwick and Bart. So these are the first moving parts we need to reach out and find a way to make happen. So initially we had no idea, and in my brief conversation with Lynn, this didn't come up, that you were already, Mike, investigating how this, how this stuff might, this information might be gathered. So what we've just, initially our proposal was to run this by you really as a, as a passive uh, beneficiary, because obviously this data would be useful to you once it gets collected and support our going to Hardwick to ask them to fund half the project. Now that we're hearing that it's valuable to you, which makes a lot of sense, the question I guess is how the three parties who will benefit, Hardwick because residents will end up with broadband, the CUD, because it will help us bring that broadband to them, and you, because you have other reasons to need it. Now, how we decide who has what funds, who can pay for it, et cetera, I guess now becomes the question, and we're not going to answer it in another five minutes of meeting. So, but that's, that's what I see in broad outline is where we are right now. Sorry. I, I, I have a, a rudimentary question, which has already been partially answered. No database exists right now of uh, geolo poles geolocation, wire size at the poles, transformers at the poles. Uh, th they're all they're out there, but there's no there's no reference document. Is that right? There's no yeah. geo database of that. Correct. Okay. Uh, of and and of any of the components on the poles. Correct. Okay, so but, that, that's 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 awesome data. I mean, but Mike, you do have a spreadsheet that has a good bit of this data. It's just not in an electronic form, correct? Um, I would say no. Which data specifically? <laughs> I, I don't know because I don't have your spreadsheet. Yeah, we don't. <laughs> Mike, you must know where, where the poles are, generally. You may not have geodata where you can say it's at, at this latitude and that longitude. That's what I'm saying. We don't have that, and that's what we need. And like wire size, I mean, you, uh, for example, you get, especially if you start getting, well, continue to get a lot more 
uh, generators, solar generators. I mean, uh, unless we do have the work that Brian did a couple of years ago, Mike. Right, get the but that, accurate footage. He's got some, yeah, some notes, but it isn't in. It isn't even in a digital form, you know, in a spreadsheet or anything. It's manual sheets yeah. that uh, right. Brian worked up. So, so, it's, so, so, it's, so it's uh, maps and some other stuff, but it's not. And as far as like wire size goes and stuff, yeah, I'm. I know most of the circuit wire sizes just because I've been here long enough, but we don't have that documented other than in the work Brian did recently, which isn't going to directly help. Uh, well, it'll be a good data source for the project, but it isn't something we can transfer into a map system or uh, geo identify any locations. All right. So uh, no, no real, no real modeling can be done. Uh, well, my, modeling. Mike, modeling. Let, this, this this is Paul, and I, pardon me for speaking out, out of turn here, but I mean, somehow you and Consolidated know who owns what poles because you're charging each other to hang wires off of, right? There's some information out there. We know who owns what poles because the PUC determines who owns what poles in what towns. So when you get to the town line, it changes ownership from us to them or them to us. So, so uh, Chris, Christine, and Paul, would you guys, you guys be, uh, your study would go and map the poles, and you know within whatever the whatever the tolerance is, GIS tolerance, uh, uh, and you would also retrieve additional information like. Uh, stuff that wouldn't even necessarily be related to your project yeah we would collect um we would like collect all, all the information on the pole you know with transformer attachments guys all those kind of things that's my point when you're and, out and, there. okay and that that would be that would be turned into a, a, a csv a, some type of usable file yeah. that could be put into a relational database for example i mean this sounds awesome <laughs> if it's yeah I mean, it sounds like a, a. I don't think there's any question that the data would be useful. What I'm sitting here trying to understand, when you say the other towns, so you're saying the other towns in Hardwick service territory, you already have that information. If I understood correctly. No, so no, I'm saying I'm saying well, we need that. So you know, Hardwick, you know, 37 percent of the polls are in the town of Hardwick. Okay, They're but we also, don't. We don't They're just also, represent the town of Hardwick, okay? We, yeah, we, we yeah, represent so, so our service we're, territory. We're going to go each to each town within the Hardwick Electric Service Territory, ask them to participate to, by contributing, because we're going to need the data for the entire Hardwick Electric System, not just Hardwick itself. Okay, so the comment about other towns having the data for example, is do you have the data for Craftsbury? Oh, you have the data oh, for Greensboro. When we say other towns, we other mean other municipal electric. Okay, utilities. so you don't mean other towns. That's Not that's where, that's where that's where I was confused. Yep, I'm sorry. And yep. I can I can I don't think I was the only one who was confused. Okay, thanks. Sorry. Sorry okay. So, so so when you say 37% of the 325, that's to the town of Hardwick, and then there'll be X percent for Craftsbury and Y percent for Greensboro and something else for Wolcott and 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 that's what you're talking about that's correct does the does the uh, utility district does that overlap 100 percent uh are you talking about mapping part of Hardwick Electric's poles or are you talking about mapping all of them all of Hardwick Electric Department's poles except Elmore and Callis well we need yeah we probably ought to get those while we're out there anyway, but but I don't think I would approach them for the little mileage they have, right? Right, we'll, right. We'll well, and, and Woodbury is outside the communication union district, but they're in the Lamoille district. That's I think is that right? They're, they're actually um, they're actually in CB fiber, and and they're and they're already get it. You're going to get that's you know, Mike. I can work with you directly on that. Um, CV Fiber is actually doing, has the money and doing the poll study for that area. So we want to make sure oh. we get that information. I mean, if we're, yeah, if we're going to spend money to do this, we need to cover our entire service territory. I, I think to do something that's short of that doesn't, doesn't make a lot of sense. 
Christine, the, the pure data you need for your effort for getting Hardwick Electric is just location of poles to see where you're going to lay out your system? Yes, it's a lot, long, that long data, right? And then the information to get wire size and transformer location, which seems to be a pretty big effort. What percentage do you think of the work is one versus the other? Oh, I think the but I think getting the additional wire size and the additional attachment is probably less than 10% of the work. But the key, key is you got to get out there and get to the pole. And once you're collecting the lat long data, you know, as quite quickly. This you demonstrates the need for broadband. <laughs> can, What's that? Christine, can you repeat yourself? You broke up uh, when you were answering Mike's question. Oh, I, I'm sorry. The, um, what I was saying is the, um, the incremental cost of collecting the additional information is probably less than 10% of over the overall cost. Because the real cost is getting to that pole and getting out your, your LIDAR device and measuring the pole. Once you're there, you can measure the rest of the attachments quite quickly. Do you have a, uh, Christine, a proposal from whoever the business was that you've been talking to about this that I could get my hands on? No, and I don't I, have any proposal. We, we'll, we'll do an RFP. Oh, I thought you had an estimate, a budgetary estimate of 208. No, that's, that's basically a $20 a poll. Okay. Uh, and, okay. You know, and it's, it's, so it's it's just a, it's just what we've been I've been you know I've been been doing this for a while plus you know consulted with other utilities that have just got these quotes you know well, I'd be happy to share the proposal I had from Empower I still have that kicking yep, around great. and that define you know then you see all the things that we are expecting to get out of yep. whichever project we do uh, and what those costs were from them. Yep, excellent. So, so twenty dollars a pole sounds like really inexpensive to get even just the wire size. Like you, you got to get up the pole, I assume, to get the wire size. It's twenty bucks a pole. Is that what it costs? Yeah, that's pretty, basically the going rate these days. Uh, Mike, um, it, it, the information that we got from Empower, there was no confidentiality limitations on that. No, no. Yeah, they were on they're on the list for the RFP anyway, so that was good. You know, they were against them. They so, Christine and Mike, maybe you could answer this question that just popped into my head, but part of this survey needs to identify everything that's hanging off that pole because there may not be room for another five a bundle of fiber running down on some of these poles, right? Or is that is that too deep in the weeds for this? No, that's part of the eval. Absolutely. It's part of the make ready work to identify whether we need to replace the pole and put in a taller pole so there's more room to accommodate more facilities. So I, let me propose um, just trying to figure out how this might work here in Hardwick. And we'll have to reach out to reps for the other towns. But it seems to me that the next step uh, having briefed you on this is for Christine and I and the other CUD reps to reach out to the other towns and get them involved in this and create some kind of a working group to figure out what's possible. I mean, is Hardwick gonna, going to be willing to consider using ARPA funds? And I, I had invited, by the way, Eric Remick, who had, uh, who had said he would be here. So I'm not quite sure what's happened there, but we can brief him on this conversation and 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 you know create some kind of working group. Does that sound like a reasonable next step, Mike, Christine? Yeah, I, I'm. If Christine, could you just throw out kind of your general thoughts of okay, Hardwick? Uh, let's say all the towns we serve are are interested in participating and willing to use funds. So if the total project was going to cost a dollar, how do you see that? Who do you see responsible for what portion of that dollar to make up the $1? Oh, well, you mean by town? I, I see pretty much by the town mileage, right? Yeah, so hard with, I don't know if I'm answering the question right. No, let me, let me make it clear. So what I'm saying is if, if the project costs $3, right. is Hardwick Electric going to, 
pay a dollar and the CUD is going to pay a dollar and the town's going to pay a dollar. So it's, the, the, I was actually going to go to the town. Hardwick, it was, I wasn't going to ask Hardwick Electric to pay anything. I was going to ask the town to pay a dollar and we'll pay a dollar. And the reason for that is because there are ARPA funds coming. We, we support that entirely. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, so I will say that that might mean you folks could be on the hook for two and three percent of Callus and uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, I mean, there might be some involvement that would be useful. The Callus is two percent. Yeah, maybe there's three and a half percent of that. Well, and I'm I'm wondering. Um, this, like I said, this LIDAR project that could locate 80% of our poles and wires, that project is only about a $24,000 item. So if that oh, knocks, oh, that's yeah, if that knocks, that's why I was heading down that street because that's cheap money to get a map set up. Yeah, you know, and then, then, then I, if we get the other, yeah. we'll still need the other 20%, but that oh, yeah. $208,000 that I, I gave you is probably more like 100000 when we get down to it, or less. So what, what happens if uh, Crassberry doesn't doesn't want to commit ARPA funds, for example? Uh, is it do, uh, do you well, what what do you what do you see if if there isn't you know complete consensus as far as? Uh, well, we need the data, so uh, you yeah. know I I'd, I'd love to split the cost with you of those that don't come along, but the reality is we need the data. So okay. But then it, it makes it a very hard sell to the town, you know, unless unless all the towns go along for any, you know, on their proportionate share for some towns to pay and other towns to be basically free riders because their residents are going to get the benefit of the data because it's going to lead to availability of fiber. Uh, but tell them it'll slow down there. <laughs> yeah, we'll put them last on the list. <laughs> so I, 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 don't, I would I would hate to go there. You know, the point is, the point is, you know, this as Paul said, you know, our, our goal is to connect fiber to every home and business. I would think, you know, in my, you know, Pollyanna view of the world, <laughs> that they would be interested. How does this relate to Kingdom Fiber, which is putting in fiber in Craftsbury and Greensboro? And well, Kingdom Fiber is, they're only connecting to within 400 feet of their existing fiber. They're not connecting every home and business. They're only connecting those that make profit for them. And I think you have to, anybody who wants to be connected has to pay a pretty healthy price themselves. That's right. That's right. So, so this is, Paul, as, as, as part of our design of the business, I think what the communication union district wants to do is certainly run the fiber, own as much of it as we can, although fiber swaps might allow us to reach places we're not ready for yet. And at this point, I think we're deciding what part, whether we want to run fiber to the home, but I suspect as a business case, somebody else will actually service the customer. And so it's certainly possible that Kingdom Fiber, who we've already worked with on some projects, will end up as the customer facing part of this project that we're talking about. I think that's fair to say, Christine? Yep, yep that's fair to say. That's a, what we're doing is we're enabling, you know, that in defense of Kingdom Fiber, you know, once you get down below 20 customers per mile or so. For them, I think they're even getting down to 15 or 13. You lose money. So you can't go in business to lose money. Um, so that's- so Essentially, you're the transmission companies with, and, and, and there'll, be distri there'll be distribution companies that are interfacing. Well, it's actually end facing. We'll be the distribution company as well. It's the end facing. It's who's going to handle the end customer. I see. That's the business we don't want to be in. So as far as Hardwick Electric making a recommendation goes or providing support uh, to use ARPA funds, is there any idea of, of uh, uh, well, of how, how, how much funding Hardwick has, whether or not this will uh, 
um, take funding away from some other project, whether or not there's excess funding, uh, I guess just um, never, what, what's the situation with the, with the funding in the town? There's never, no. it would be nice if Eric were here, but there's never excess funding. <laughs> yeah, so I, I have talked to Eric and to John Jewett about this. At this point, they're not even certain how much money is coming in. We think they could be getting in excess of 90,000 direct to the town and then another tranche of two and a half times that from the county level funding. Now that we're looking at a project that might be on the order of 100,000 rather than north of 200, you know, and Hardwick's share would be 34 of the whole project. You know, now potentially we're we're asking them for 17, 30 or 40 thousand dollars, maybe, or half of 30 or half of that, half of that, right? Yeah. Yep. So that you know that starts looking like a pretty good return on their investment. And it's coming because the CUD is leveraging this federal money plus our ability to obtain grants and things like that as well as low interest loans and whatnot so hardwick can help us leverage that the more I, I guess the argument we make when we go to the towns is the more the more funds you can help us with and and effectively we're asking them to split it the the more we're and more quickly we're going to be able to deliver fiber internet that, that was my next question is why does this funding help help the uh, um, uh, the utility district why, why why do you need this funding I mean do you guys already have the funding or it's coming comes in on a on a slower schedule well we are funding so it, basically we're, we cover uh, right now we, we have 48 towns in our membership. We're, de we're developing a plan for all 57 towns in the NEK, you know, 57, there's a few uh, uh, bordering towns. So the total cost of the project is $136 million to get every home and business connected with fiber optic cable. You know, right now we think we're gonna get about 40 million within the next six months, but we didn't get 136 million, you know, so, so every dollar we can, we can get helps get another, another address connected but you know if we spend it's a you know if we spend money on things that we don't have to that's less people to get connected so ultimately right. okay. it, it's the northeast kingdom does not make sense from a business standpoint yeah. to connect every home business and fiber and it, neither did a rural electrification that's right that's right neither rural <laughs> exactly so I, you know part of this and i you know all your questions are legitimate when you know, why would, you know, if Hardwick doesn't want to spend any money, why would it make sense for Craftsbury to? And, and that's a legitimate question. I think what, what we're trying to come at this from is there's a benefit for putting a small amount of money up front to bring your town and the Hardwick Electric, uh, I won't call it infrastructure, but data about the infrastructure up to a level that many other places already have. And, and it's because, you know, Washington Electric or Green Mountain Power are, are bigger companies doing things differently than HED. So I, I guess it's, it's a case of we're all in this together. And, and that's the argument we're gonna have to make to towns. And, and There's no guys, guarantee. Go ahead, I'm sorry. And, and you, you guys would provide all the poll data all that data at no cost to Hardwick Electric. Yeah, it's a, I mean, you know, it's a yeah. once. Yeah, of course. It's, yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I don't. Know. <laughs> yeah, we're we're a muni we're a public institution, you right. know. So it's it's that. So yeah. Paul, uh, is there? I mean, should a town be somewhat nervous that you're asking for money now, and this is just to support a study, and then you're going to come back and say, well, now it's time to put the fiber in. Now we need some real money. So, so this is interesting. You've hit on a really critical piece of this. When we went to the town to ask them to join the communication union district, we, we explained to them that the legislation that enables the communication districts does not allow us to, to uh, 
ask for or receive any funds from the town ever for any reason. Yeah, but tax, now, tax funds. This is not funds yeah. from the town. This yeah. is federal tax dollars or federal borrowed money that may someday be tax dollars. You figure that out. Right. But so this is not strictly speaking uh, resident tax dollars. And so it, it's a little trickier ask to the town, but you, you, you asked an important question about okay. it. That's good. Bottom line is that the town can't be put on the hook for more. And, and there's, there's precedent for having these kinds of, of funds within within the restrictions, the, the state legislation within those restrictions, there's precedent for these types of funds being transferred. I, I don't think there's any precedent for these types of funds ever before existing. Yeah, this so is, this is, this ARPA funding has got its own set of right. requirements, but it's been clearly vetted. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I looked at the ARPA, just looking at the ARPA guidelines, I mean, it, it, it's an, uh, you know, an obvious fit, a really good fit. Christine, you said you have 40 million. Let's assume a year from now there's 70 million, but you need 140 million to build out everything. If you're starting with 70 million, you're not sure when you're going to get the rest. Is there a concept of how you would spend that money? Would it be a spread out over 59 communities or be a, a poor project and you'd build on it in the future? How would you decide where to spend that money? So we've got a kind of a three phase plan. The first step is does depend on grant money. We need to build up our assets. Once we build those assets, we can borrow 40% on those assets. So phase two is we borrow money from these national cooperative banks that are funding telecom. And that and that's, you know, we build a business plan and we build a business case that so year four, we can go to the bond market. With the infusion of grant funding, we can build a very strong business case that works. Without the grant funding, you can't build a business case. So in other words, the densities are so low in the Northeast Kingdom that we needed an infusion of grant money in order to make the business case work. Once we've got that money, we can build a business case and then we can actually get funded through traditional channels. Because we're, customers are still gonna be paying for this, right? You know, you're, you still get, you're still gonna get revenue and you build your business on that revenue case. But that revenue, that, that revenue itself without the grant would not pay for the infrastructure. So do you, do you have a, a build out hierarchy right now? Yes, we're finalizing that as we speak. Um, we, we've, uh, we've, we put together a, uh, a business plan for the Northeast Kingdom. We have the towns prioritized. We basically divide it into 24 distribution areas and you know, built the backbone. We've already got we've, the plan is finalized, um, and and it's actually been approved. Um, so we will be making that available shortly. Now, obviously, you en envision this being affordable for those who have internet now, but we'll see this as much better. That's correct. Yeah, far far superior in terms of. That won't be hard. Yeah, that's right. And I'm sitting here in Wolken working off my, you know, crappy DSL and my crappy Starlink satellite, but I bonded them together to make it work. <laughs> um, what's the time for, what's your time frame on this? <laughs> for getting the, uh, for, for, getting, for getting the data. I mean, uh, it, it uh, we'd like to get the data within six months. I'm ready to make a motion. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I don't know that we have. I mean, if you'd like to 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 create some kind of sense of the board that is supportive of this work going forward, that would help us when we go to the town of Hardwick. But I, I don't think that's critical if if that's more than you feel the need to do today. I'll second, I'll second Vince's motion. I mean, Mike, if getting this data within six months, I mean, it just jump starts. I mean, it, you know, provides, I mean, you need it for AMI, right? For impl implementation. No. A lot of, you don't, okay. No, the, uh, what we need it for, it really is uh, some long range planning 
so that we can start doing some real system studies um, so that we can start talking about implementing an outage management system once the AMI is up and running. Christine knows this very well. Um, so it's not something we need tomorrow, but it's certainly something we need to be getting a hold of and organizing and getting into a place where we can start using it. But, but do we want to wait? Do we want to wait even no. for the process to be? And that's that's no. that's no. that's why when I'm hearing six months, and six months puts us in the middle of the winter, uh, so it's going to be more than six months. Uh, well, we want to make it less than six months, so we don't hit the winter. Well, what what was the timeline that you had that that you have scheduled, Mike, right now? Well, like I said, I was I was moving on this, and everything got put in park when Christine got hired and started working down that street. So I've been in a holding pattern to see what partnership can develop or what, you know, is this going to make uh, things easier for us and them or, so that's what this discussion is about for me, learning. Yeah, yeah so it seems, it, it seems as though creating one RFP for the entire HED service area and then having some kind of agreement between the town's Hardwick Electric, the communication union district, as far as payments or, or management or whatever, makes makes probably the most sense to get the most bang for the dollar rather than breaking it up. So, I mean, that seems where we're going to have to figure out how to go. And since it's your territory, it makes sense that you're the the lead on on that. But as Christine has said, we you know. We've certainly had experience. Oh, Lynn has something to say. Yeah, let me let me put this out there because, again, I think I think we need the data. I don't think there's any argument about whether we need the data, whether we want the data, whether we want to work with you. I'm looking at the notion of going to the towns because this is this is the scenario that I see. Oh, Hardwick, you know, and, and this is, you're going to go and you're going to say, we need this for broadband and it's going to benefit Hardwick Electric. And as soon as they hear that it's going to benefit Hardwick Electric, they're going to say, well, why isn't Hardwick Electric paying for it? And Hardwick Electric has a lot of money. And, and that's, that's what they're going to, that's, that's what, what, so. Well, I, I guess you know, we're going to leave. It's going in and saying Hardwick Electric is, you know, you know, this is, is I, I, again, I just think it's it's a very hard sell to the towns who are chronically short of of, of funds and um, you're nailing where where I was. That's why I was suggesting maybe we build the initial foundational piece of this and say, boom, hey, here's a lidar model to start working with, and we paid for it, so we contributed well, to it too. I think I can speak for the. CUD, at least for the executive committee, and I suspect the board, I mean, our initial proposal was we'd pay for half of it, hoping the towns would pay for the other half. I don't think that changes, Christine, if we want to pay for half of it and Hardwick Electric wants to pay for half of it. I, I think we still, whether oh, yeah, it's- I don't, the, yeah, they, yeah, the idea is we're, you know, we're, we, it, it, look, yeah, whatever makes it work. Well, you know, for, for example, you know, as as uh, Mike said, if you're all prepared to go do the lidar study, we'll you know we'll we'll go pursue the other twenty percent. That may be the way to go. The, 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 the distinction is that these are ARPA funds rather than hardwork tax dollars. And worst case scenario, the town says no, and you end up having to, you know, hardwork electric ends up having to get the data which it need pay for the data which it needs anyway. Or, or, or wait until you guys, uh, the utility the district, uh, get some so, data because you guys need it anyway. So I'm hearing that my board is supportive of this, and it sounds like Christine and I need to spend some time together. Yeah, that's, a, that's the answer. Well, why don't, why don't Mike and I come back with a recommendation? Yeah, and, and from my position as a town's rep, we haven't reached out to Barton yet. This is the first approach we've made. I, I'm glad we came to you rather than Town of Hardwick first because you've given us some questions that we might not have thought of going to them initially. So um, you know, thanks for your time. And uh, yeah, I think that's the next step, Mike, is you and Christine figure out where to go. And, and Christine will let me know if and when we want to bring the Town of Hardwick into or the other towns in at all. I have one 
question, a curiosity question, and I don't want to get us off topic because of that, but are you going to uh, have partnerships with providers such as the entity in Craftsbury? Or are they that's, kind, uh, of, a, are we, they kind put, of an island on their own? Uh, we put out a, a request for partnership to 52 different telecom companies. We got eight responses. Last Friday was the cutoff. So we're evaluating those responses to determine who our partner or partners will be long term. But it's, you know, it really has to be, you know, we're talking about a lot of construction. We're talking about 600 miles of, or yeah, 600 or 50 miles of fiber a month, 600 a year. So, you know, it's got to be some, we, we need capacity. Um, not that, and we'll work with, we're working with Michael Birnbaum and Kingdom Fiber, but you know, we're probably going to need a larger organization. Yeah, and I, uh, I'm fortunate enough. I actually, uh, Tilson Broadband actually came down my road. Yeah. And I used to be on satellite turtle speed for $189.99 a month. And now <laughs> I got a gig for $79.99. Yeah, exactly. It's exactly. crazy. Yeah. So let me also, Christine and, and Mike, you guys, I mean, it seems to me once fiber is getting run, running extra strands or enough strands in that for all purposes is easy enough to do. So yeah. once that fiber is there, it's there for HED to use given appropriate agreements and things like that as well. So what we're planning to do really will benefit your customers at some point down the line should the need arise. Well, at a minimum, we hope it we hope it grows the local economy. <laughs> exactly. Well, so I I think, Christine, if if you're done, I think we've accomplished what we set out to do, and we can let these folks get on to their meeting. Yep. Thanks so much for your time. So, this was you productive. Thanks, time. guys. Thank All you. Right. Thanks. Bye. Thank Bye you, everybody. Thanks. Okay, so the next <laughs> item on the Mike, Michael. I'm sorry. What? I uh, just telling Michael he's dissolving into his background. <laughs> yeah, that's been going on a lot. It's uh... okay. It's coming yeah. virtual. <laughs> you know, you could make a mighty good argument for saying if you're going to go to the town of Hardwick, you don't even want to mention Hardwick Electric. Well, that's uh, right. <laughs> But that's their problem. No, you know what, it, you know what it, Mike it, looks like? It looks like he's on the transporter in Star Trek and he's getting transported somewhere else. Uh, it's, it's a transporter that's not working. <laughs> <laughs> he's going to get stuck in between he's dimensions. Stuck in limbo. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so the general manager's report discussion is the next item on the agenda. Um, any questions or comments? <clears throat> I'm still, a, I'm still a, amazed that it, 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 buying the transmission lines from Green Mountain Power is such a great deal. I have one question on H11. So what's the, when is the expectation that it will be up and running? When it, they are going to be online in August and be fully commissioned uh, before sep, uh, September 1st. So they're going to come online with less than, than their full... Well, they come online and then they have a bunch of testing to do. Okay. Yeah, yeah it's just it's just more uh, planned scheduled work. But until they meet that, uh, yeah, no, I know this final I know point in the PPA. Testing, but... Yeah, yeah. Okay, but but commercial COD is in September. I believe September one. Yeah. The... Mike, I I have a quick question just to make sure I understand the. Um... The next step after you just updated us on the GMP transmission line, you said the agreement of a joint purchase with Morrisville Water and Light. Um, what what is that in what does that involve? And yep. So right now, uh, for us to actually obtain a tie, a wire path to the Velco Stowe substation we have to purchase into the Morrisville water and light system, which the savings, I have the 
proposal from multiple years ago, the previous manager had worked up from Morrisville for us. Um, and what they've, what they proposed then was you say, you use your savings for the first two years or whatever the, it takes to come up with the number that they say the price is. And as I recall, it would take two years to pay them to become joint owners and own whatever capacity we need in their system to get our power from Velco Stowe through their system to us. Wow. And the way the benefits of that are, or the, the major um, benefit to doing it that way is then there's no wheeling costs, there's no need for transmission agreements between them and us, which would circle all the way back and just land us in another Schedule 21 like we're with GMP now. So, so did I think of it like it's um, you, it's a next step because it has a similar sort of benefit to this GMP transmission line purchase? It's, it's basically getting power to us you know, well, there's, there's three steps to this entire thing. One was yeah. to get ownership of the line section. Two was to get joint ownership with Morrisville Water and Light to Valco Stowe. And third is to end Schedule 21 services from GMP. Then we're done. The, the Morrisville component is for pass, basically to have pass-through ability. Are, are there any constraints on, on uh, total load through the, uh, or no. does the joint ownership just eliminate? It's all about uh, eliminating problems with losses and deliveries and wheeling fees. Um, it's it, real clean and. All right. I, I didn't read it like closely. Does it uh, obligate Hardwick Electric to any uh, improvements on the, yes. pa the pass through lines? Yeah, we, sh we would share um, our proportionate share of the capacity of the line would be our proportionate costs into improvements of the line or maintenance of the line and annual maintenance, maintenance of the line uh, that we looked at a couple of years ago when I did 2016, it was running about 6,500 to $8,500 a year. So it's nothing. No. Okay. So but for example, say Hardwick Electric's load doesn't increase, but Morrisville Flight and Electric does. Would Hardwick Electric still be required to pay for? No, we would only pay for our load requirements. Okay. Yeah, based so, on the load. So, so that so the load so it's being measured on the basis of coincident load on the basis is it a daily an annual a monthly how is? So is, the way Craig had structured it, Lynn, is he says, okay, this line is capable of carrying thirty megawatts, mm -hmm. and. Uh, a kilowatt is worth X number of dollars. So if you need a thousand of those kilowatts on this line, then you pay a thousand times X kilowatts. That would be your price. Okay. The, the, you said the, it would be really helpful to see what this agreement is. Um, you said sure. to finalize an agreement and we haven't seen it. And you said that basically the payment would to get we'd get to joint ownership by paying essentially over time the savings right. that we have by virtue of having bought the GMP line. Correct. So, so right. That, so we'd pay them three hundred and thirty thousand dollars over the course of two years. We'd use our savings from not being on GMP anymore. Take that money, pay them over two years. Correct. And then after that, we put that money in our pocket every year. Okay. And and Morrisville Light and Electric wouldn't be allowed to. I mean, you. It means unlimited and continued access to those those lines. Yes. Yeah. Similar. They did a similar agreement um, the year I joined Hardwick Electric, and it the timing wasn't right for us to get into that. But that's uh, John. The village of Morrisville Water and Light had proposed this to both. Hardwick Electric, as well as Johnson Electric. And Johnson did it. So I have actually the contract they signed and I can share that with all of you too. You can check that out, but it'd be a very similar deal to that. Yeah. I think we need to see the contract and sure. then we will need to approve it because it is it is a, a significant amount of money. Yeah. Well, what's, what's the benefit to Green Mountain Power if we giving them 330 as opposed to 165 a year 
it seems like they're losing money after the second year. I mean, why? why they are. They, they are, but they don't have a choice. Uh, under the PUC rules, we can buy that line if we want it. They have to oh, sell okay. it. They have to sell it. Yep. Okay. So, Mike, another another question back to the solar. <clears throat> this We have the solar that's, we think, going to go in on Center Road, and then this big 2.2 in Wilkett. It still doesn't – it's not clear to me why – we like that. I mean, they're, they're going to pay us up to $25,000 a year, but aren't they taking away some business that we would have otherwise made more money on? Well, no. The way no. those projects work is, and I don't know that I explained it well in my report, but the independent power producers, every kilowatt hour they make is purchased by every utility in the state. So the biggest utility buys the biggest portion of that kilowatt hour the smallest utility buys the smallest portion of that kilowatt hour and our portion is a very small so even though it's in walcott most of it's going to green mountain power that is correct yeah huh. do uh do, do the developers retain the the wrecks or would those go to hardwick electric the wrecks are i'm not positive how that component works um because it's not a net metering project right, right. Um, these are standard offer projects. Yeah, they're standard offer. So, but with Hardwick Electric is the is the facilitator entity. Uh, no, we just yeah. we're just the wires to get it into the grid, and uh, everybody pays pays through the standard offer program. But we can charge them for our wires for getting it into the grid. Transmission fee. Mike, no, mm, no. They don't pay well, us anything. They're in our service territory. They're using our lines and they don't pay us anything. No, they do. Uh, I'm not, I'm not positive, Lynn, to be honest with you, how I, that I've piece never, works. I, I've been, re I've been representing IPPs all over the country for many, many years. And I have never seen a situation where they didn't have to pay something to the utility we, that they were interconnecting with. You say yeah, they, they have to pay uh, any upgrade fees or any work we have to do to connect. allow them to tie into the system comes out of their pocket. Absolutely. But you say in your general manager's report this month, Mike, that it's upwards of $25,000 financial benefits for us. That's uh, correct. But so that's, through, that's through the payments that will land at VEPSA from the developer because the developer block has to be, uh, can only be utilized by utilities in Vermont. And the PUC gave VEPSA uh, utility status in those projects. So the actual utility in that IPP project is VEPSA. And but they will be getting money from the developer monthly. And, and that's where that money to us comes from. So what you're saying is they, they'll, have, they'll have a source of revenue, which is going to reduce the amount that the members have to pay them. You got it. Ex, ex, so that's, that's correct. And well, it's going to reduce it proportionally or, or that, that goes directly to the fees that Hardwick Electric pays up. So, or is it just proportional? Typically everything at BEPSA is proportional, but I'll dig into that further because I think Lynn is right. We probably get a higher benefit because it's in our service territory, but I'll have to check and get back to you all on that. And that benefit that we get, that 25000 is then, what, a credit towards the various VEPSA bills we build up during the year? Right. So if our bill for uh, VEPSA for the year was $25,000, that would negate it. But so it's not it's not going to be a credit, Mike, is it? It's just, it's just going to be, BEPSA has a budget of a million dollars. I'm picking a number out of the air. They have a budget of a million dollars. And they get paid a quarter of a million dollars by the developer. That means that the members only have to come up with $750,000 rather than a million dollars. Okay. It, it, is that what? No. 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 Nope. Okay, nope. then I'm thoroughly confused what this is doing. Yeah, they they sell power to the block, the independent power producer block. All the utilities pay them for that power. But let me let me 
circle back and give you much better answers on all of this because I'm not positive. Yeah. And, it, would be and good, it would be good to, to see an explanation who the developer is, what they're doing, how this whole thing is going to work. That would be. Uh, I'm going to have Ken join us and uh, he, can, he can tell you all about it. Super. Mike, how, how big is Wolcott? How many megawatts or kilowatts? Wolcott, what? Our hydro. Our hydro is a one megawatt unit. So in the past, we've talked about problems with transmission wire sizes. Is there any possibility of them producing 2.2 megawatts in Wolcott will stop us from producing full output if we can't have full output because the transmission lines can't handle it? Uh, no, the transmission line is, is well-sized for that. I do have concerns though, Mike, um, and that'll all get shaken out in the system impact study that will determine what they do or don't have to do, what they can and can't do. And the thing that is raising my concern is since we do have that hydro, which is a rotating machine, could this large solar array, 2.2 megawatts, along with our hydro actually create an island? We don't want that. Uh, so the consulting engineers, I've made them very aware uh, to take a good hard look at that before they write their report. Don't they have, I mean, grid sensitive, grid signal sensitive automatic shutoffs? I mean, if the grid does go down? Right, but if, if we became an island, then that facility could see our hydro as the grid. I see. Because it's a moving machine, it doesn't it doesn't need the grid uh, to run. This is a, where this is a typical uh, typical use of a synchrophaser for you got it yep. getting data to be able to shut down. So uh, it led to another question, which went in my head and right out. <laughs> It'll come back. Yeah. And, and so, Mike, you're going to look into whether there are any wheeling charges, interconnection charges, any yep. of that. But, um, okay. I had one question. Um, you know, right now we're we're in, in in you know again the the revenue seem to be more over budget than the than the expenses by quite a bit. I'm wondering whether there are any, but this is, you know, this is based on April data um, and oil with prices. Our, with our seasonal infusion. Oil prices are going up, have gone up considerably. Um, and I'm just wondering whether we have any projections or what any concerns that that power costs, especially, you know, purchase power costs, the extent that we're buying spot are going to go up um, a lot. Well, the last uh, information that Sean had provided us wasn't predicting that, but certainly, like you say, oil prices are going through the roof and things could be changing. So I can certainly invite him uh, to join us again and give us an update if you'd like that. Or, or at least an answer to you know his view on that on that question. And okay. if, other people, if people if people would like him to come, that's that's great. But you know, I, I our coverage ratio has been pretty high, so we don't we we shouldn't have to worry. Huh? About going into the spot market, right? But the target, you know, they they have landed high a couple of months, but the target is still ninety five to one hundred five. So. Right. You know, if, if things go dry, we'll get, we'll see a lot less from Wolcott. And it's and pretty dry. Dry. Things are, <laughs> my lawn crunches. It's not yeah. even a lawn, but you know, the, the greenish brownish stuff. Yeah, we haven't, the hydro hasn't been running for about nine days now. There's, there's yeah. not enough water. Hey, Mike, yeah. Mike, Mike Michael Ambrosino, you just left your back east again. I'm home. <laughs> Must be Spock saved him. Okay. Were there any other questions or comments on the uh, general manager's report? I saw Mike that you, that that you sent around the the uh, 
COVID stuff, I, it came, I was, I did not have access to it um, this afternoon. So I, I have, I have not looked at it. I don't know if anyone has any questions about it. Well, Jess, why don't you just walk us through that? Okay. Um, so it's just giving you it's, uh, a shorter version of the ones that we did have to give you the 2018 through 2021 30, 60, 80, 80, 30, 60, 90 day breakdown just for the month of May. Um, hopefully, hopefully as of June 30th, we'll be able to start disconnecting again. Um, but looking at emails going filed through the PUC, there looks like they... <laughs> There's a lot of people who want to extend it out till August 31st. So. so I don't have that sheet right in front of me. What was the 90 for 18, 19, and 20? So the 90 day for 2018 was 23,182.76. For 2019, it was $85,093.58. 2020 was 79,681.52. And as of 2021, it's $122,025.99. So 100, we're 100K over pre COVID numbers. Yeah. Yes. Well, well, we're for the 90 day. 19 wasn't COVID. So we're, we're, 19 was 85k if i heard correctly yep yes so, that's what she said yeah but 18 was only 23,000. yeah well that yeah so that's, but that's the question crazy. is was 18 the anomaly or was 19 an anomaly right. i you know I, I i don't know but um i guess on the disconnection issue are so long as somebody says they'll do a plan we're not going to disconnect them right that's correct you know yep. even if they're many thousands of dollars in arrears that's correct we so and and so yeah as long as they make a plan and stick to that plan that's good so there's not really anything we need to decide here i don't think because no. we're just waiting to yeah, see we if we just yeah. hadn't looked at this in a couple of months, so I just yeah no no it's good go back and it yeah. and it shows that we should over a probably an extended period of time be able to bring it down. Maybe it's fifty thousand, maybe it's a little more, and that'll be good when that pulls back in. But it'll take time. Yeah. And Jess, are any of the details uh, kind of hammered out yet on the upcoming funds or any general? Uh, process nailed down yet or is that still up in the air uh not exactly sure i know that they did have one training last week on a day that i wasn't here in the office so yeah um, we'll have to figure out um and get somebody reaching out to the state of vermont on that one yeah and and jess actually made a really good suggestion last um uh, after the last funds were available that we should just apply for our customers, you know, provide that service mm -hmm. with and through them to, to make sure everybody applies because, and you can speak to that, Jess, because a lot of people never even applied as you were telling me, right? Correct, correct. We'd have customers that we did reach out to, um, multiple phone calls, door notes, um, a mailing, um, and then and actually physically spoke to them and they're like, oh, yep, yep, I'll get to it. Yep, yep, I'll get to it. And they never did. Now they're, you know, a thousand to two thousand dollars still behind where had we gotten the OK, kept them right on the phone and we logged in and filled out the paperwork for them. They would have applied right then while we were on the phone. But don't they have to sign? No, there's nothing to sign. Well, <laughs> The last version there wasn't. I don't know what this is. Who's applying is the person. The on this one is a long. Um, the last thing I heard, it, it's a long process for applying for it because it's just for renters. It's not for homeowners anymore. Yeah, the the previous block of money, Lynn, uh, Jess had to actually go into the system and say, yes, this is our customer. Yes, this is what they owe. There was a process where 
Jess actually had to do some approvals in that process. So I'm assuming they're going to structure it similarly. I mean, so, you know, I have no issue about us approving things that we're required to approve. I just want to make sure that there isn't any issue about submitting something and saying you are John Smith. So in oh, no, 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 no. That's in this not round, the goal. It's, <laughs> it's requiring way too much information. It's requiring income information, landlord information, everything. It's, it's a, the application process for it is not even anything like the VCAP program. This okay, so that's way more in depth. The idea that you, we had previously is not even on the table anymore. Correct. Okay, so scrap that. Okay. I have a, another question on something else, Lynn. Go for it. Um, Mike, in the, uh, go, go back to the Craftsbury Academy. They put in the original meter. We inspected it and said it was okay. Isn't there anybody from the state who also inspects or not? So the state fire marshal and electrical inspector has to inspect any and all work that an electrician provides at a commercial facility in Vermont. That's what I thought. But he does not inspect anything that utilities own or work on and he has no authority over anything we do because the standards he is knowledgeable of and responsible for don't apply to us gotcha. because we're an electric gotcha. yeah, as a utility we have to follow the national electric safety code which is different than the fire code which utilizes the national electric code right. that electricians follow yeah, because a, a builder friend of mine said, well, didn't the state inspect and say, okay? And I said, well, I don't know. Okay. They did, but they didn't look at the metering because that's yeah. utility equipment. Gotcha. Any other questions or comments? I, I, I remembered that question. Um, well, it's a couple questions. One, so is... Uh, is the Wolcott Dam, is that acting like a, a synchronous capacitor at all because the rotating mass? I mean, is that, does it have any frequency support capacity or, or anything? Or, I mean, is it, does that uh, question make sense? I'm just thinking about it as a, uh, ask you know, me, right? Ask me again. Okay. Actually, first things first. Are okay. we all set with Jessica? Can we cut her loose? Absolutely. One, one Jessica question, perhaps, but um, what, what's the plan for the office uh, being open? That was the select board when I represented us at the board meeting this week, said, hey, when's the Hardwick Electric office going to be open? Uh, yeah, I think I think that's that's in the new business discussion. Yeah. yeah. But I don't think okay. I don't think we need Jessica. OK, that's great. That. Thanks, Jess. Have Thank you, night. Jess. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. -bye. Bye. Actually, you scrap scrap that first question. The, the more more importantly, I was thinking about you know the AMI implementation, uh, being able to get that data because I, you know for example, an uh, independent power producer if it goes, they have to make the improvements, but uh, if it's a if they connect to bulk power, uh, ISO New England requires you know requires a a, a load study and um, it it. And the bulk power, you know, Velco is required to uh, have a load study every three years. Uh, and, but there aren't, it sounds like without the, the poll data, the wire data, no, you know, other than your personal knowledge, there, there isn't any way to uh, quantify or, or do any legitimate studies of, of you know, what the, uh, uh, like a stress test for the system would be, for example, you know, like uh, having all these additional solar projects coming online. I mean, I, I know that they're at, they're sort of ad hoc, but they're not. There's not. It's not methodical, and it's not in the in the same way that a, a Velco study would be or an ISO New England study would be. So I, I guess is there a question there? The question is. Do you, is that part of the uh, plan to be able to do these tests, you know, do a model 
for example, uh, you know, uh, uh, if uh, a whole bunch of solar. So I do, we do model every project and run load flows and perform system impact studies, but it's a manual process. It isn't like right. I can say, oh, it's on this circuit. Here's the map file, run your magic. Right. I have to do all that manually to give them the data to run their, their program, which adds costs, which don't matter. Well, I mean, it adds costs, but the customer or the developer is paying those costs. So it's no harm to okay. HED, but you know, it would be a lot less of my time digging data and organizing stuff for these guys to run their studies, but we don't have that many. It isn't like there's a hundred a year, you know, we've right. probably run, uh, I think all told system study work we've done is probably a dozen projects that, that needed it. So it's not a high volume. But have still, if having the data and being able to, uh, you know, plug it into whatever MATLAB or what, whatever is being used makes it a lot easier on you. I mean, you know, Oh yeah, totally piece of cake. If we had that. Yeah. You just enter in the new power source at a specific location. Yep. Uh, I guess that was my question. Uh, the the financials, the, uh, um, I don't know if you want to discuss that as part of the your report or as part of... Uh, part of the report, if you have questions about it. But okay. That well, it, it would yeah, be. Let the, Jessica go. Right. <laughs> well, yeah, it, it would be the variances, I guess. The uh, yeah. So we let Jessica yeah. go. Right. Okay. Well, she doesn't necessarily discuss the variances on uh, when it when it has to do with the uh, the coverage. I mean, the the, the coverage is is you know, VEPSA determines uh, what our coverage is going to be. I mean, VEPSA determines they're ultimately responsible for the coverage ratio. Correct. They target a coverage ratio, but that gets shifted up or down depending on what our customers actually use. Right, right. And what I, they target a ratio, but I see a continuing, um, you know, last year it was always pretty close. I mean, you know, 99%, uh, 103%. And now it seems to be 10 to 15% off. Uh, I'm just curious what the source of the, the variance is. Uh, I mean, it, it seems to be, there seem to be different reasons for the, for the, this, the variance and the size of the variance. I mean, can you comment? Uh, I mean, they're laid out, but it still seems like VEPSA isn't really. Yeah, I think that's a VEPSA question. Okay. And we sort of poked this when we were doing the review of the budget and we knew that their protocol, their methodology for planning our, our needs for this year was fundamentally flawed. Right. Because of the data set they were using and we agreed, okay, we're just gonna exceed. We're gonna be on the high side and that's the way it's gonna be. And so here we are. So I, I think we had, we had him he described how he did it. We knew we were tracking ahead and we knew we were gonna to continue to track ahead unless COVID came back with a vengeance. Right. So it's kind of an, a one-time anomaly due to the, the way the models don't fit a COVID world. Okay, right. and, and, and I, re I do remember he also provided some assurance that it would uh, converge back to a normal uh, coverage ratio. Uh, you know, or desire. Yeah, something. you're you're right. I heard that too, but I didn't believe it. But I mean, we'll see. It'll be what it'll be. This is all an estimate. You know, it, it's yeah, right. it, it's a four. But it needs to be accurate. In a normal year, we I think it's a reasonable expectation that the models be good enough to be accurate. They'll ne they'll never be accurate. But it's it's uh, well, they have been since I've been around. I mean, it's the they can be close, but but. Yeah, that's what we mean. Yeah. The, the plus but, but, or minus factor for this year is is completely out of the norm. Out of whack. Yep. It it is, and but the also the month to, looking at it month to month also can turn on 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 the weather in a month, um, and things like that that have nothing to do with 
with how things have changed with COVID as well. So you've got that going on. Right, right. But so, it has, it's been four months. So that, that's, that's what, that's the reason I brought it up. Yeah. So we're just going to live through it and we'll see if he's right, if it converges, but this is going to be a year. I'll bet my bottom dollar at the end of this year will be probably 7% over on, on demand. Yeah. And, and you're right. Thinking about it, prices are all over the place and supply, they're all supply chain issues, which end up having other impacts and yeah. So anomaly. <laughs> Fortunately, it doesn't seem to have any real negative consequence to us. Right. That's, you know, the negative, the negatives are much more overcome by the positives and we're just fine. And if our new hemp customer comes online, we're that's going to really change the equation. Yeah. <laughs> what, what is that? Uh, there's a new indoor hemp growing and processing facility being built uh, <laughs> just past Gravel's sand pit heading towards Wolcott. They have a lot of 270 kW of lighting. Jeez, a lot oh, of LED wow. lights. Just lights. Jeez. That's no motors, no nothing. They're so going to be a big customer. 5,800 Kelvin LEDs. Yeah. That's great news. That is great news. And I'm Authentic Log Homes is running uh, about 20, the, their first bill, if that's an average bill, they're going to be about a $28,000 a year customer. So that's good too. Oh, that's dispensing with their diesel. Yeah. So is that hemp outfit in any way uh, connected to the other one, which is then across the road? No, nope, totally new. Competitor. Uh, that's uh, the hemp center of the Northeast Kingdom. <laughs> yeah. Smell it driving down 15. Yeah. Right after you go buy metals, recycle. Yeah. Yeah. The first time I went in there, they were, they had their pressure cookers going. And I smelled like that stuff for the whole day. <laughs> Terrible. <laughs> well, it's, it's better than a pig farm. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. I just want to come back to the coverage ratios because I, I'm I'm seeing you know the year to date coverage ratio <clears throat> through April as ninety seven percent. Yeah. Which is right where we expect to be. So I I don't I you know yes it's moved around month to month. And I don't know if it's tracking now. I mean, it was below, the actual was below budget. Now it's above. I don't know what it's gonna do this next month, you know, for May or for June, but I'm not, I'm not seeing something that's that's that looks and so strange to me. That is the target, is to be between 95 and 105 for the year. Right, and, yep. and so, uh, yeah, I, I think. Is, is his modeling pulling off a, a a 365 day data set or is it uh, a 30 day or is it or is it multiple sets we can ask sean again okay. we can bring him in if you guys want to rattle him that's no problem the, the reason I, I ask is because if it's 30 days then the fact that it's at 97 percent isn't significant but if it's 365 days the fact that it's 97 percent is great it right. means that it the model is pretty good at long range forecasting Anyway. Okay, anything else on the manager's report? Then, sorry, I had to, have to change the view and rotate back. <laughs> oh, shit. Um, the next item on the agenda is is uh, a, an employee matter? Is is there a motion to move into executive session? So moved. <laughs> we, we need the words. We need the words. All right, I'll make a motion. I move that we go into executive <laughs> session to discuss uh, a confidential employee matter. The public discussion of which could jeopardize the discussion. 
No, just uh, we don't need that part. It's just a confidential employee matter. It, okay. And 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 Mike seconded. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, we are, it is six twenty nine, and we are now in executive session, or will be as soon as the. Okay. Um, okay. So. Um, so on new business. Uh, hang, on, hang on. So it's uh, 640. Oh, it's, it's 641 and we are back out of executive session. No action was taken. Perfect. Um, so new business. Uh, and, and there are two questions that are similar questions, though they are don't necessarily have the same answers. Um, one is when and how are we going to reopen the office? And the other is whether we are going to start having our meetings in person. So, so as far as we, we, we take the office first. Yeah, as far as the office goes, we've been having um, weekly VEPSA conferences and everybody's been sharing their hurdles and successes. And uh, I think Seven of the VEPSA members are open now. Um, I think Swanton was opening today, so that'd be eight. And I think the others uh, that have discussed it are looking at the first week of July. Um, I'm not against opening anytime, but it's been kind of, uh, since we're missing people in the office, it's kind of been a blessing that we haven't had to deal with traffic coming in from outside. Um, Cause I think the staff could get overwhelmed. We get pretty busy here when people are coming in the office. So I haven't been in a rush to open, but I think we're there and uh, it's time to get it back on the table. Let's go with the beginning of July then. Well, I don't want to be the last one to open either. So, I, you I, know, I, I, Barton. I, I certainly don't have, you know, I think you open when you can. The town offices have started opening. Yeah. Um, I think, um, you know, some signage, I think, you know, saying that unvaccinated people should wear a mask. Um, and yeah, we have all the, we put in those, uh, or we have those hand stations and all the stuff that we closed so it didn't go out but we have all that stuff so we're yeah, going to get that I mean, all mounted and you know the hand stuff is less of a concern simply because it's not transmitted by hand it's it's a respiratory virus but um but yeah i think i think you know um i guess the one question is ventilation is, have, have we tested the space to, to make sure that, that there is good ventilation in there? Uh, no, we have not or, tested. Or do we have fan, some, something? I mean, that's, 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 the, that's the issue. Yeah, that's what we were doing before, before we closed down is we made sure the customer area was essentially under a vacuum. So we had fans blowing out from the counter space out the window with windows open on the opposite side of the the office. So air was always coming from the staff to the public and out the window behind them. But we haven't done any testing on that. Okay. But that was I, the I, goal. My understanding of, of, of the current recommendations are, you know, people who are vaccinated don't need to wear masks and people who aren't vaccinated should be wearing masks. And I think so long as we have signs up to that effect and have some masks available for customers who come in who don't have a, who aren't vaccinated, who have a mask. I don't, I guess it's a question, are we gonna start asking people? And I might, you know, I'm, uh, for, and I don't think we would, but I don't know how other people feel about that. Well, yeah, what um, caused it was a question when I was at the select board meeting and it came up from one of the select board members but um, even though we're independent of the town of Hardwick, we're kind of across the street, similar name. People probably think of us <laughs> as part and parcel. And that is exactly what they're doing. What you described, Lynn, 
is what they're doing. So yeah. to the extent we're comfortable doing what they're doing, it probably saves some brain damage for everybody. Well, and we are we are a part actually. I mean, we we yeah. we we're we're governed separately, yeah. But we are a department of of the town. Um, so, yeah, I I'm I mean, I don't even know that we need a motion with that for that. You know, if everybody's okay with that, um, I think my that's that appears to be the consensus, which takes us to um, our meetings. Um, and I, for one, would be in favor of meeting in person. Um, I am zoomed out, um, but I think I don't think we should meet up in that room. I think it's too it's too small. Yeah. So I think I think we should probably be meeting in in the memorial building upstairs. And I think anyone who's not vaccinated needs to wear a mask. So that's uh, right. What about the possibility of a hybrid, like Zoom and? I don't think there's any reason for a hybrid. Yeah, except I'm not going to be in the area oh, for that's, a few that's, months. That's your that's your problem, Vince. <laughs> no, I'm serious. We didn't have you know we didn't have 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 hybrid meetings before, and I don't see. I think it's 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 difficult to have a hybrid. We we need all kind to have a real hybrid. We need equipment that we don't have. Um, you don't see when someone's going to want to to say something. It, I I think you know this 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 has always been. It's simply the quirk of COVID that this wasn't in person, and I believe the select board again talking about what the town is doing is going to in person meetings. Yeah, and that's I, what I saw. That's what I saw this week. I don't think they're going to hybrid. I'm. I, was I, no. Well, I was interested to see because I wondered like we've all observed. We're, you know, we're the, we've run the whole world on Zoom, but no, they weren't. Um, and I, 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 I'm, I'm uh, one of the uh, public members of the search uh, committee for for a new town manager, and and the the sentiment of the select board was not to be doing it as a hybrid. Okay, so, so I, and and can you be specific about? the reasons for not doing it as a hybrid? Be, because, because it's important to see each other and to interact and to, and, and to, and if we get any public at the meeting for them to be able to see the commissioners, when we haven't had an option and we're all in, this, we're all similarly situated, but if a hybrid, we're not all similarly situated. Well, isn't okay. it, it's a requirement now that if you, if you have a remote meeting, you have to have a physical presence. So you, if you want to stay remote, you can't, you have to go hybrid. If you want to go in person, you don't have to have remote. I, I, again, this, first, this is my view. I don't see, I don't see a reason to do it. Other people, people have all kinds of commitments and other things, and we all make our choices. Right. And, and, and prior to, prior to COVID, the tools weren't available. People weren't familiar with them. They hadn't been incorporated into meetings and standard processes, and now they have been. And people are familiar with them. And, and to return, say, a dogmatic return to a particular type of process, I, I don't think is necessarily, it may be productive, but I don't think necessarily, and I don't think it should be um, uh, disregarded out of hand. I mean, I agree with you. It is, in person is absolutely better. I mean, I. That's my personal position, but at the same time, I think uh, the benefits of having people be being able to attend who otherwise would not be able to, uh, uh, I think, at least should be examined as to whether or not they outweigh the benefits of having an exclusively in-person meeting. My concern is that if we have a hybrid, other people may not come as well, and and it defeats the purpose of having an in-person meeting. Okay. My, people... my concern is that we we did try hybrid meetings, the first couple meetings, um, and it was a nightmare. It didn't. It didn't. We are not equipped. We don't have the equipment to do it okay. properly. Um, that, I, and that's it, where it, I'm sitting. Sure, and and I agree. You know, having the video components, but having a, uh, you know, having at least the person being able to call in. And it being on on mic or not, I mean, I, I think that's 
a viable option. And, and yeah, people have commitments. You're right, but I can't fly from Washington State for uh, once a month for uh, for a board meeting. Well, I don't know how others feel. <laughs> I, mean, I, well, it, I, I know, I, but that kind of that just seems like a. Uh, it's not my. It's well, not it, it's my, like it, saying tough luck when when the technology is there and it is a, there is a little bit of discomfort involved. Mm -hmm in implementing the technology doesn't seem productive to me necessarily. I mean, I may agree with you, but it needs, we're, I think it needs all, to be discussed in any case. All, so. You're supposed to be a full-time resident of Craftsbury to be full -time, on- I'm, I'm, I am full-time resident of Craftsbury, well, part of the IRS. Not, not if you can't come to a meeting because- No, no, you're, you're making that definition post facto. I mean, uh, I, I, I hear what you're saying, but I don't, a lot of people have to travel. Are, are you, uh, Roger, I mean, you, you're gone for, you know- I'm Yeah, not, I'll miss. I'll miss some meetings, but I have in the past. These guys haven't right. shot yet. I've managed to keep it to a minimum. Right, right. I mean, do you feel, okay. I mean, using that as an example, um, do you feel it would be beneficial to uh, have a, be able to weigh in on, on things if you're not there, if the tech, if technology is there, you know, or if it's a, yeah, anyway, if it's possible. Uh, well, I'm, I'm not there, you know, when I travel, I'm traveling, you know, when I'm away, I'm away. And when I'm here, I'm here. So I'll do it when I'm here and I'll, I'll be absent when, when I can't be here. And I, if my life becomes, you know, I hope I don't get to this point of this stage in my life, but if I was having to travel all the time and be gone, I'd, I'd simply step down. Right. Okay. That's a that's a that's good information. Yeah, I, you know, I would say that you know it's summer. People are going to travel, both for business and pleasure. I don't know what my schedule is, but I think the opportunity not as a regular thing, but someone says, all right, you know, what, I'm going to miss a month, and you can even just call in, and maybe the the methodology is you can listen. You can't say anything because it's confusing when someone on the phone is talking to a group, but you can listen in on the phone, and you can vote when there's a vote, just so you've got some input into a meeting. But you know. If you're not fully participating, though, then 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 how how do you know if you've actually heard the discussion? You know that that things haven't cut off. How do how do how do people evaluate your what you're saying? Because you you may or may not hear the person. I well, listen. I I think we can. Is there? I think it sounds like we need a motion. Uh, I mean, my motion is, it, I would want to follow what the town is doing, um, which is to have in-person meetings. But if a majority of, of the members of this commission want to have some call-in option, then, then, then that's a route that we would at least go for the next meeting and, um, and see how it works. And we may need to revisit it. Um, we but we have consistently, uh, this board has consistently tried to follow the structure that the town does. So I think that's a legitimate point. Can if one member is missing from a meeting, it's that's okay. You know, we've dealt with that. It's not necessarily a big deal. We get warning. I mean, things come up. I, I missed the last meeting because it, it was scheduled for, for, for a Jewish holiday and having it remote or not remote wasn't going to help me. Oh, yeah. And, and, and if it was one meeting or maybe two, it's just uh, it will end up being more than that. And I know I let you know that, Mike, uh, some months ago. And you said, let me know what, you know, when you plan on not being available. And um, you know, that included that extended time period. So there's yeah. another big, another big plus to in-person meetings is it's much easier for uh, visitors, uh, people we bring in from whomever, legal issues or VEPSA people. I mean, we all know one another well enough. Maybe we can work in this format, but when you bring in other people, it's an awful lot better if they're in a physical situation, not a remote. I, I don't disagree. I mean, I, I, I I like in-person meetings much better. Yeah, I, do, I just want to make sure that uh, 
I can contribute uh, according to my responsibilities. Uh, well, that's up for you to decide. Much as I can. Well, no, I mean, you're, you're setting the, when you say that, that's, that's based on the premise that either you have it, either you have physical meeting or you don't have to be there. I mean, that's, that's what it sounds like you're saying. For me to decide. I mean, that's that's based on the premise of physical meeting. Period. It's it's always our own decision whether we're coming. No, no. Again, that's based on that that exclusive physical meeting premise. It, it, these have always been physical. They were required to be physical meetings, Vince. And last month, only it, because it is only it was only because of COVID. Because no, right, of and historically, situation. and that situation has passed. Right, and historically, we rode on horses. Uh, but, I mean, this, but this is a public, a local public board. Where no, I, I, I hear, and, I hear and you. If okay. you're not here, again, my feeling is if you're not in, in, the, in the community, if you're not here for, then you, you, you're not going to be getting input from anybody that, that, that comes. There's, you know, Nat's point about when VEPSA comes and makes a presentation, it's 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 going to be want to be there different process again i think i have a i you know we've been we've been we've we try to run the meetings from five to seven it is nearly seven um we need to make a decision about the next meeting um well go around the room as we say well we I think I, I think it's clear that I would like us to meet in person. I think we should meet in person as well. I'm not against technology. But yeah, I, I'm signed up for that, and it's going to hurt me just like Vince because I'm going to be getting back out on the road. But but I understand the symmetry with what the town does and why we do it. And you're right, Vince. Maybe down the road the world will change, the town will change, but I don't think we're there yet. To wrapping things up. Yeah, and, or, and I'm, I, I don't disagree with you. I just, I think it needs to, those, these things need to be discussed. So even though it sounds like I'm arguing, I'm not necessarily, I'm bringing up countervailing, you know, uh, bringing up other issues. So yeah, I, I guess I just abstain from, from that, in that case. I'll agree with in-person meeting if you want. I'll loan you my transporter machine I used before. For <laughs> Looks like it's working right now. <laughs> oh, that's the best line of the night. That Thanks, was great. Mike. Yeah, that was great. Um, okay. Well, on that so, note, on that note, Lynn, you yeah. should probably adjourn us. <laughs> I am going to adjourn us. Well, wait a wait, wait, motion to adjourn. Do we need to uh, accept the minutes that were distributed? Oh, good catch. Now. We did. Yeah, you did. We did at the beginning of the yeah, meeting. I'm all yeah. done. Okay. All good. done. Um, okay, I missed it. I move to adjourn the meeting. Is there a second? <laughs> Any opposition? No. Hearing none, we are adjourned at 6 59 p.m. Have a lovely evening, folks. Bye. So Bye. Do you need Bye -bye. to come in and sign those minutes? So Lynn can't sign them, I guess. I can't sign them because I wasn't there. You wasn't there? Yep. See you tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. See ya. Okay. Yep. Yeah.